Hello, everyone. Uh, welcome to our webinar. I'm going to wait one second here while some people get on the line, and then we will start. All right, welcome to Multidisciplinary Approaches to Serious Challenging Behaviors in Autism. We are very happy today to be presenting Dr. Matt Siegel, the Director of the Autism and Developmental Disorders Inpatient Research Collaborative at Maine Medical Center Research Institute. Um, this is a part of an ongoing webinar series that we've hosted with various partners, and you can see uh, our eight previous webinars here, they are all free to access online at that URL, sfautismsociety.org slash webinars. But today's webinar is special because it's our first in our new virtual symposium focusing exclusively on the topic of severe behaviors. Please note that if you have any questions for the presenter today, there is a question tab in your control panel, which should be to the right of your screen. So just type in your questions. And um, Christina, my co-presenter, say hi, Christina. Is she somewhere? Hi there. <laughs> there she is. Hello. <laughs> okay. Um, uh, you know, she will uh, be handling the questions, and I will chime in as well. If you're calling in and you don't have the screen, you can type in your questions to me at jill.escher, E-S-C-H-E-R, at gmail.com. If for some reason you can't see the presentation screen at this time, please look under your browser. Sometimes it's hiding. All of the attendees are on mute, so you can go ahead and um, have a party, and we won't hear you. The webinar is being recorded, and I know a lot of you can't stay for the whole thing, so it will run for about an hour um, with Q&A as time allows. So um, I'm very uh, pleased to present to you Dr. Matt Siegel. Um, he is a very active uh, researcher and clinician who really specializes in this area of um, severe autism and severe behaviors. Um, he is the primary investigator for multi-site study specifically on children severely affected by autism. And a lot of studies actually uh, ignore that population, and so we're very um, glad that he's doing that work. Um, he serves on the Autism and Intellectual Disability Committee of the American Academy of Child and Adolescent Psychiatry. He attended Amherst College and Stanford Medical School and completed triple board training at Brown in child psychiatry, psychiatry, and pediatrics. He is an assistant professor in the Department of Psychiatry at Tufts University School of Medicine. And then as sort of a side thing, he is co-founder of a very special camp for children who are kind of on the other end of the spectrum called Camp Alsing, which is also located in Maine. So with that, I am going to turn it over to Dr. Siegel. <clears throat> Hold on, let me. All right, Dr. Siegel. Great, thank you, Jill. So I wanna thank Jill and Christina and the Autism Society of San Francisco uh, for having me on and all of you for taking the time to listen. <clears throat> So today we're gonna to talk about multidisciplinary approaches to serious challenging behaviors in autism. Um, and uh, our agenda for the day is uh, first to talk about common behavioral challenges in autism. And since many of you registered for this webinar are parents, you can certainly describe this well, I'm sure. Um, and then we're going to look at what are some of the sources of that challenging behavior and how do you think about um, those sources and figuring them out. Um, so then we'll look at what are the different approaches that one can take to challenging behavior um, from multiple perspectives. And I'm gonna do that primarily by using the example of a multidisciplinary program in Maine that I direct, um, which is a specialized child psychiatric inpatient unit um, at Spring Harbor Hospital. And we're gonna use that as an example to exemplify these um, principles. <clears throat> also going to hit kind of general treatment components that you might look for in any program uh, that you're um, seeking out for treatment. And then um, also present some consensus recommendations. Um, as disclosures, uh, to be transparent about things, um, 
uh, which is the habit of those of us in the science and clinical worlds. Um, I'm an employee of Maine Behavioral Healthcare, which is the parent organization of Spring Harbor Hospital, where we have our developmental disorders program. I also have research funding from uh, NIMH and several foundations. Uh, and then, as Jill mentioned, I also um, am a clinical advisor and helped co-found um, Camp Allsing, which is a uh, camp for higher functioning kids with autism to work on social communication and have a great time at camp. So what are the common problems in autism? And uh, parents out there, of course, could probably answer this better than, than I could. However, um, I think some good information comes from one study where they looked at about 500 kids um, in the community, not a clinical sample, but a community sample. And this is what parents reported, 60% with easy frustration or low frustration tolerance, 50% with inattention, hyperactivity, um, and then uh, less frequent but significant other behaviors, including um, temper tantrums, 30%, irritable, fearful or anxious, 13%, and then um, more serious uh, potentially behaviors, harming oneself, uh, such as biting oneself, scratching oneself, hitting oneself, uh, 11%. Uh, destroying property 11% and physical aggression, meaning aggression toward other people, 5%. And I found this particularly notable because this is a community sample of kids who were um, surveyed because they had an IEP at school, not because they came to a doctor's office or a hospital, and still 11% um, with self-injurious behavior or property destruction and 5% with aggression. So I think um, in that sample, there was, it says to me that these are significant problems even for kids who are out in the community. So <clears throat> a question that comes up a lot with behaviors um, is, uh, you know, how do we identify them and um, are they, should we do anything about it? Because everything takes time and effort. And, uh, you know, I'm sure many of you have seen behavior plans where there are 14 different targets and things that people are working on to reduce 14 different behaviors. And I think the question does need to be asked, um, is this something that we need to target and try to work on or not? Because there's only so much time and resources. Um, and so for me, some of the key, key questions about is it significant or worthy for clinical attention is how much does this behavior interfere with learning? How much does it interfere with socialization and produce social isolation? How much does it interfere with participating in community activities like being in a restaurant, going to the grocery store? And then of course, um, sometime, something where we uh, may not have a choice and we have to interfere or we have to try to intervene is does this behavior cause injury to the, the individual or others? Is it damaging the physical environment? Is it impacting family functioning in a significant way? And also has it failed to respond to kind of typical parenting techniques uh, and those type of things? So those are some of the things to think about in terms of is this something that we want to focus attention and resources on? Uh, and so one example of this is um, sometimes people are uh, focusing on repetitive behaviors or stimulatory behaviors such as hand flapping. And I think we have to ask the question there, well, how much is the hand flapping really getting in the way of some of these things? It may be, but it may not. And so I think if it's not, and we have other more serious behaviors going on, then we want to focus our attention there. So how do we approach challenging behaviors? Um, well, in the a broad brush, I think we have um, a series of choices or potential therapeutic approaches for challenging behaviors. So, um, and here is a listing of, of some of the primary ones, although not all of them. So applied behavioral analysis, certainly a major um, modality. Um, treating psychiatric comorbidity, which I'll go into more, which means um, identifying and then attempting to treat co-occurring psychiatric disorders such as anxiety, depression, ADHD in individuals who have autism. Um, addressing communication strategies, whether that's AAC um, or functional communication interventions, social skills, social cognitive strategies, um, sensory regulation domain, 
psychotherapy approaches, particularly for those who are more verbal or more communicative, um, including there have been trials for CBT in high functioning autism for anger and anxiety and emotion regulation approaches, certainly treating medical problems that could relate to the challenging behavior. And finally, looking at family uh, support, family systems and um, training, parent management training, which is training or support in being able to run and deliver um, a behavioral plan for a, a child. So those are our different modalities to approach things. And so I'm gonna use the example of aggression because um, that's probably our, our most problematic behavior besides perhaps self-injury. Um, so aggression meaning physical aggression toward others. Um, so, uh, I'm going to say something odd, which is we don't want to treat aggression. When aggression presents, that's not what I want to focus on, um, or that's not what I want to treat. If I have to, uh, then I will. But what I want to do is go through a process because aggression is not a disorder. Aggression is not a, um, a discrete disease in and of itself, um, it is a final common pathway symptom. And the question is, what is leading to that aggression? So in no particular order, is it psychiatric comorbidity um, that is leading to it? Is it that um, the aggression serves a behavioral function and is being reinforced or maintained by various things uh, in the environment? Um, is the, does the aggression relate to problems with communication? Um, does it relate to side effects of other treatments? And uh, other options, uh, does it relate to a dysregulated sensory system? Could it be uh, a result or a symptom of a mismatch between demands and abilities? So uh, an individual is being given work in school that's too hard for them, and perhaps that is relating to the appearance of aggression. Um, or work that is too easy for them, for that matter. Um, family changes, so is there a new baby in the home, those types of things. And uh, finally, other major domains are, do we have medical illness or pain going on? Um, is the aggression genetically linked in rare cases? And um, how much does it relate to challenges with emotion regulation? You can certainly think of other things that could lead to aggression, but these are some of the major domains that I think are important to consider when you think about what is leading to the appearance of this symptom, aggression. And so when I say I don't want to treat aggression, what I want to do is identify things that are leading to it and try to treat upstream, if you will, to treat these things um, rather than um, just trying to simply treat the aggression. So to look at a few of those domains in more detail, um, Psychiatric comorbidity is um, a significant domain in autism, once again, meaning the co-occurrence of other um, of, of psychiatric challenges such as anxiety, depression, et cetera. So here's um, some information. So in youth with intellectual disability, generally, this is non-autism, uh, about 40% have a DSM-4 or um, less technically a mental health um, diagnosis or disorder. In youth with aut which is a very high percentage, in youth with autism it's even higher. In one study it was 71% had an identifiable um, co-occurring uh, mental health disorder. One study um, that looked at this in great detail uh, was a very good study where some uh, very fine researchers who are quite familiar with autism took a typical diagnostic instrument for psychiatric disorders and they modified it to make it essentially speak autism. They modified it so that it, they felt it would be more valid for kids with autism. And then they ran 109 kids who had at least some spoken language through this measure. Um, and this is what they found. Um, a lot of anxiety, um, and these are the specific anxiety disorders that were identified. So 44% of kids with a specific phobia, meaning an intense discrete fear, such as bugs flying around them or lightning, um, OCD being obsessive compulsive disorder, almost 40% by that measure, separation anxiety, social phobia, and generalized anxiety, which means generalized worries about things. Um, so a lot of anxiety disorders. The other major finding was 31% with ADHD, attention deficit hyperactivity disorder. 
then followed by mood um, being depressive disorder, 13%, oppositional defiant disorder, 7%, and finally, more rarely, bipolar disorder, 2%, and in this sample, uh, no kids with psycho psychotic disorder or psychosis. So certainly, um, I wouldn't focus on the exact percentages here. Um, making these diagnoses is a challenge, and this is just one measure, though I think a, a well-done study. However, I think the takeaway is something that many of you probably know implicitly, which is um, actually in autism, it is the same as with the general child population, which is the most common um, mental health challenge is anxiety, which is true of neurotypical kids also, followed by ADHD, followed by mood disorders such as depression. And thankfully, things such as bipolar or psychosis are relatively uncommon, though they do occur. So that was psychiatric comorbidity. In terms of um, applied behavioral analysis and um, behavioral treatment, the question there is, um, from that perspective, how do we make sense of challenging behaviors? And the big question that that discipline and field tries to ask is what is the function of this behavior? Meaning, what is this person getting out of this behavior? Why is it continuing? Because theoretically, we only do things that um, serve a function, that, that we are getting something out of or um, that is uh, somehow being maintained or else, or else the behavior would disappear. So some of the questions are, what is he or she getting by engaging in the behavior? What is reinforcing um, or rewarding the behavior? And what's the outcome of the behavior? So there are four primary functions of challenging behavior. Uh, social attention, that is gaining the attention of others. Access to preferred, meaning obtaining items or experiences that the person desires, so getting access to an iPad or, or such. Um, escape or avoidance of non-preferred activities, so being able to avoid doing math or uh, other undesired things. And finally, the fourth um, sort of least defined category, which is automatic reinforcement, meaning that somehow the behavior is internally reinforcing, whether it's self-stimulatory, it eases pain, or produces a sensation that um, uh, is pleasing in some way, or it satisfies some cognitive or internal logic. So that was looking at behavior generally. Now another major domain is emotion regulation. Um, and this is an emerging concept in autism that there are specific challenges and deficits with regulating emotions. Um, and this is really kind of a more cutting edge concept in terms of research. Um, so I have just a little graphic here representing this, which is um, one way that some thought leaders in this area have thought about emotion dysregulation in ASD is that there are many contributors and the research is trying to piece this together. But it could be that some people with autism have lower inhibitory control over their emotions. Um, there's certainly the cognitive rigidity and, and uh, kind of poor flexibility we can see with some people um, that can lead to this um, difficulty reading social and emotional cues, sensitivity to change. Um, and then there's a lot of work going on looking at is there a biological predisposition to this in that um, in terms of having high physiologic arousal or reactivity and neural circuitry, et cetera, all kind of contributing to this concept of there being specific vulnerability, you might say, to, to emotional dysregulation. Um, which really emotional dysregulation, you, you could probably say is just a fancy way of saying tantrums. So another major domain that we identified was medical problems. Is the person experiencing illness or pain? Um, and so to review, what are some of, you know, I think sometimes in autism we get focused a little on more exotic medical problems that we hear about, but um, the interesting thing is, is the most common medical problems, and, and if we're going to have a medical cause of a challenging behavior, the most likely things are um, this list, uh, which are not exotic. Um, so seizures 
uh, there's a base rate of most people think of about 10%, maybe up to 20% of seizures in individuals with autism. And there's two peaks of onset of that. There's kids who have them in early childhood, but then there is a group of kids with autism who have never had a seizure in their life and suddenly at adolescence, um, they begin to have one or more seizures. And that takes people by surprise, certainly. Um, I think a very important point, um, and certainly any parent could identify, is GI problems, gastrointestinal problems, are a major issue for many kids, and that those problems are typically the most common problems are constipation or encopheresis, um, and that and so it's so common that essentially any kid who was doing well and then begins to develop um, challenging behavior agitation, that's one of the first questions we have to ask is, could they be constipated? Um, which is not always as straightforward to uh, figure out as you might think. Um, other possible common medical problems, GERD, which is acid reflux, allergies, minor injuries, ear infections, headaches, dental problems, and certainly sleep deficit. So those are some of the common domains uh, that we look at in autism. Um, something that I wanted to mention, uh, and maybe seems a little out of sync here, but we'll go ahead and do it, is um, I think we went through some of the um, therapeutic modalities that one would consider for challenging behaviors, um, including ABA and other approaches. Um, but I think it's important to identify um, that while there's a lot of things we don't know in autism, we do know that there are some approaches that should be avoided. Um, and that's because the, there is either evidence of harm or there's been enough study that it's pretty clear that there's no effect in autism. And so I, I wanted to mention uh, those. And this comes out of a document from the American Academy of Child and Adolescent Psychiatry. Um, so chelation, which is um, the removal of heavy metals uh, from the body, uh, which is appropriately done when someone has lead poisoning, but has been applied to some individuals with autism. And uh, there's never been any scientific evidence for benefit of doing that. And there have actually been two deaths of kids with autism documented and reported who are undergoing IV chelation treatment. Uh, and they were not being treated for lead poisoning, they were being treated for, quote, autism, close quote. Um, and so I would strongly advise not pursuing that uh, in any form. Um, secretin, uh, which um, was quite popular um, some time ago, there have been numerous scientific studies. In fact, it's the most studied uh, medication uh, in autism is secretin and clearly shows that there is no benefit from secretin in any form. Stem cell procedures, there's been no scientific evidence of benefit and there are substantial risks to injecting stem cells into a person. Hyperbaric oxygen treatment, also known as HBOT, has also has a lack of scientific evidence for benefit in autism. And finally, something that is uh, you know, less dangerous, certainly, but quite popular at times, um, is the gluten-free, casein-free diet. And there, I think it's not well known, but um, there have actually been six randomized controlled trials showing no effect of this diet on behavior, uh, and certainly not on problem behaviors in children with autism. Um, and so what, what I might say about that is, is yes, it's potentially relatively harmless to do. However, it's not totally harmless because everything we do takes time and energy and resources that are being diverted from potentially uh, more evidence-based treatments. Um, so, it, you know, there are uh, effects and side effects of everything we do. Now, if I, just to be clear, if an individual with autism or an individual without autism has celiac disease and has an allergy to gluten or casein, then they should absolutely be on this diet. But what this is saying very specifically is there's been no effect on behavior in kids who just generally have autism of going on the GFCF diet. So who do you turn to? Who can help with challenging behaviors? Uh, and there's quite an array of professionals, and we'll mention some of them in a minute. Um, but um, here are some things, rather than who to turn to, what kind of person uh, should you be looking for and, and thinking about? And uh, so here are some of my thoughts, is that given that as we've looked at, there are multiple domains to consider when you're thinking about a challenging behavior, um, 
the first thing is is that you might need a team or at least a few providers who can work together on a challenging behavior. Uh, you should certainly try to seek providers who have experience in autism um, and looking at behavior in autism. Providers who can coordinate their care um, between appointments and, and uh, communicate. Um, I think importantly, trying to find providers who think broadly and consider issues outside of their specific training or discipline. You know, there is the saying, if you're a hammer, everything is a nail. Um, but I think that providers can think more broadly about what might be going on. So even though I'm a psychiatrist, I can think about to what degree um, the lack of having a functional communication system is contributing to this behavior that's being brought into my office. Um, Another important concept, I think, is look for providers who want to treat the person or the individual with autism and the presenting symptoms. I think it's a red flag if you go to someone and they say that they're going to treat the autism. Um, I think that we unfortunately don't really have uh, treatments for the autism itself, at least outside of the early intervention sphere. And so, um, you know, I think we want to uh, be a little wary of someone who thinks they're treating that versus treating the symptoms and the person who has autism. And finally, you want to look for people who have a commitment to utilizing the best evidence-based interventions that we have um, and are aware of, of that where we don't. So as an example of multidisciplinary treatment, I'm going to use uh, the program, one of the programs that I direct, which is um, at, at Maine Behavioral Healthcare, we have <clears throat> a continuum of treatment services for youth with developmental disorders, particularly autism, who are experiencing behavioral or emotional challenges, uh, or both. Um, and so we have a specialized hospital unit called the Developmental Disorders Unit. This is Spring Harbor Hospital. I know it looks like, doesn't look like a hospital, but it is a hospital. Um, and that unit is served by a school called Spring Harbor Academy. And then we also have a day treatment program for outpatients. We have a multidisciplinary outpatient clinic, and we also have a research program. So I'm going to tell you about this DD unit a little bit, and it's a, as an example of how to approach problem behaviors, um, severe problem behaviors. So the kids who come uh, into this hospital unit, as we showed in this study, come with pretty serious behaviors. So this was uh, this graphic shows what was the chief complaint, in other words, the leading problem, uh, and it was almost 30% with physical aggression toward others, 23% with self-injurious behavior. 17% with property destruction, tantrums, and then a few other problem behaviors. Now, this is what was the leading behavior. Um, however, as you all know, many children have one or more of these behaviors, and they arrive as a package. And that was the breakdown for kids coming into this hospital unit. So this is certainly not your average kid with autism or kids in the community, but rather these are kids who are being hospitalized because of serious uh, challenging behaviors. So the treatment philosophy of this program is um, that children and family and community systems can be engaged during a hospitalization to look at both the key acute and chronic sources of crisis, and we'll go into that a little more. Um, the other kind of pillar of our philosophy is that positive behavioral reinforcement, in other words, a positive support behavior plan, can help children take the risk to give up old behaviors and learn new ones. And I like the phrasing of that because it's very empathic, uh, meaning that a child may be doing something that is a big problem for other people, such as uh, aggression or self-injury, However, um, this behavior is continuing because for some reason this is working for this child. They may not even want to be doing it, but it's working in some way. And so it's a risk for them to give it up and try something new. And so I think that's a very empathic way to look at challenging behaviors. And then finally, being rigorous about diagnosing and treating psychiatric comorbidity, since it is relatively common, can improve outcome and reduces polypharmacy, which means the use of multiple medications. So how do we do this? Um, so following from the graphics I showed you where you need to look at multiple domains of what is driving a challenging behavior, what is the source of a challenging behavior or sources, we have multiple providers. So we have child psychiatry and pediatrics, a behavioral psychologist, a board certified behavior analyst, 
um, special educators, speech language pathologists, occupational therapists, nurses, uh, social work, and um, another occupational therapist. So we have five, six different disciplines here on this team, all working on, on a child's individual case. Um, as I alluded to, the foundation of treatment in this program is first, a highly individualized behavioral plan gets developed, and everything goes into that plan, including the communication and occupational therapy supports. So that's where you see the integration of these different disciplines is in developing this plan. We also do targeted psychopharmacology where it's appropriate and where we've diagnosed uh, co-occurring disorders. Um, and then finally, the last part of the treatment is to try to transfer skills, behavioral management skills and other skills to everyone who supports this child, whether it's parents, their local school and, and or in-home providers. So to bring this alive a little bit, I thought I would give you an example, um, just a kind of brief case example of this. So um, here's just one example. Uh, we brought, uh, had admitted to the hospital a six-year-old girl with autism spectrum disorder with mild intellectual disability. Um, and this is how she presented, or this was the reason for hospitalization. She was having frequent tantrums, um, totaling up to 120 minutes a day. And during these tantrums, she would become aggressive, hitting people, kicking people um, 20 to 40 times a day. So that's our problem. Um, her, a little bit of description of her, um, she was nonverbal, meaning she had less than 10 single words. She was reported to use the picture exchange communication system at school, but not at home. Um, she had some motor difficulties, fine and gross motor deficits, and this meant she had a little difficulty using utensils when she was eating. She had uh, pre-K abilities, which kind of matched up with being six and having mild intellectual disability, but she had some splinter skills that were stronger. Uh, importantly, physiologically, she was awakening three to four times every night uh, at home. And she was also on medication. She was on a medication called Risperidone, four milligrams a day. And she was also taking Benadryl as needed, uh, presumably to try, to try to limit these tantrums. Um, and just to say, this is a, a large dose of a serious medication for a six-year-old child, a very large dose. So the question is, as you see this picture, the, the question, kind of a basic question is, what's your diagnosis? Meaning, what, what are the reasons for the problem? The problem being tantrums with aggression. Um, and so what are the domains that you're going to look at to think about that? So as just another graphic way to exemplify this, here are some of the diagnostic domains one might think about for this problem of tantrums with aggression. So uh, does it relate to her communication ability? Is there medical illness going on? Are there unmet sensory needs uh, or oversensitivity? Is the aggression serving a behavioral function as we talked about uh, that's being maintained in some way? Could it be a side effect of her medication? Could the risperidone be making her tired and tired people are irritable and irritable people sometimes engage in aggression uh, as an example? Uh, could this relate to something going on in the family uh, or at home or at school? Could it relate to a genetic syndrome? And finally, could it relate to a co-occurring psychiatric disorder? So this is how we try to think through some of these different areas, and there could be others here, of course, um, and, and think about it in a clear, systematic way. The reality is, is um, people don't don't, their picture will be a little bit of different pieces of these things. Uh, so this is a figure to kind of represent that, where they may have um, some anxiety, some ADHD, tired, have some communication impairment, and the behavior may be serving two functions. It's allowing them to escape demands, and it's also uh, supplying attention. So this is kind of the reality of, of um, how these things work, but I think to work through them, you have to try to think of them as discrete entities. <laughs> so here's what we thought after looking at taking a history from the parents and other other providers, and then watching her for a few days. Um, 
this is the things that were striking. Uh, she definitely had communication frustration. She was in fact not facile with her PEC system, uh, meaning she could not spontaneously functionally communicate uh, her desires and needs. Um, she could exchange in a rote fashion, but that's different from being spontaneously functional. Um, something that's quite notable about her is that she was confused and disoriented, uh, we thought, meaning that she didn't really understand what was expected of her, what was coming, what she was supposed to do now, what she's supposed to do next. So she was lacking some of the supports that uh, fortunately have become more common in supporting people with autism and creating environmental predictability. She was tired and sedated, um, both, I think, related to her waking up quite a bit during the night and um, having a large dose of medication. Um, another thing we noted is that people easily slipped into inconsistent expectations with her because she was very cute. Um, and, uh, and so that was a problem. And um, <clears throat> there was, by the history, a lot of reinforcement of her behavior by attending to these tantrums. Uh, as well as allowing her to escape tasks, uh, non-preferred tasks. And finally, uh, she actually seemed kind of generally hungry because she was struggling at mealtime. So those were the things we identified. And then, so then what did we do? Well, we did what I would call a broad and deep intervention, broad in that we, here's the problem, tantrums plus minus aggression. Uh, here were the major domains that we thought there were issues. So there was communication issues. There were issues with how the environment was responding to this behavior. There were sleep uh, issues and tiredness. Um, there were problems with her, the structuring of her environment, kind of that disorientation. Uh, and also for her, there was difficulty with eating. So we went after these different areas, as you can see below. So for communication, we worked on her communication. For the behavioral response, first of all, we weaned her off the medication she was on because by definition it wasn't working um, and replaced that with a behavioral plan where we did we reinforced her when she was not tantruming, uh, but also did not allow her to escape tasks. For a sleep deficit, we worked on sleep hygiene and uh, for many kids that alone will, will help them sleep better. However, she seemed to have a pure uh, sleep disorder with awakening in the middle of the night. And so we did Dr. have to... Siegel, can I just ask, ask a quick question? What do you mean by sleep hygiene? Uh, yes, thank you for asking. So sleep hygiene is, there are several components, but sleep hygiene is essentially having good practices around sleep. So having a regular bedtime and wake up time, having uh, people sleep in a dark room, um, not having electronics and screens and other kind of stimulating activities, both not in the hour before bed, but also not having it available in the room. Um, because if it's available, um, one will then wake up potentially to engage in those activities. Um, and not having other kind of rewards or reinforcements during the night. And so this is relatively easy to do in a hospital setting, harder to do at home, which we all understand, um, but still something to aspire to because many sleep problems will respond to have trying to have better sleep hygiene. Thanks. Um, thank you. So uh, for her, however, that did not work. And so ultimately we did have to use a medication to try to help her sleep better, which was called trazodone. We structured her environment with some things that many of you are probably familiar with, like a visual schedule, countdown to transitions, doing motor breaks, working on tabletop learning, those kind of supports. And finally, we actually gave her some adaptive utensils and helped her eat more efficiently so she'd be less hungry. <clears throat> Excuse me, of course I have a cold as I speak to 200 of you. Um, so this is the outcome. This is a, a graph of her hospital stay, which was about 40 days. Um, so you see this is aggression, was one of the target behaviors. Came in with anywhere from 20 to 70, 80 aggressive acts per day. Uh, and this over time went down into very low, although not zero, um, uh, number of aggressions a day. So that was the outcome for, for this child, for this case that I presented you. This was a real case. 
So um, I went through that to kind of exemplify how one could bring together a multidisciplinary approach to try to address a challenging behavior uh, and one that had resisted, in her case, um, pharmacologic intervention, um, I think some behavioral intervention at school, uh, and um, some other interventions. So it really took this multidisciplinary approach to try to um, get things better for her. And it's not that that could only be done in a hospital, um, but I'm just using it as an example of uh, one way it was done. So the other thing I wanted to present to you more briefly is um, some of these elements, uh, and then we'll go to questions. Um, some of these elements that I talked about um, uh, in terms of treatment, uh, I organized here in another way, which is if you um, were bringing your child or adult um, for treatment in a program for a challenging behavior, what, what are some of the kind of key elements, I think, in a treatment program? Um, or what are some of the key strategies? Uh, not that you have to use all of these, but here are some of the key strategies that, that we identified um, in a project we did where we were trying to help other um, psychiatric hospital units do a, a more effective job with children with autism. So they're, they're basic. Um, so first was to gather more information uh, that's specific to autism. The second was to really address the basics of the person's needs, uh, and we'll go into each of these, um, to support their predictability and activity level, to give them positive behavioral reinforcement in a, a systematic way, to help them develop concrete coping strategies, and also to enhance communication. So this is an example of what we developed for with uh, one hospital system uh, who did not have a specialty program but wanted to be more effective with kids with autism and severe behaviors um, who are coming into their hospitals. So the first thing was we developed this tip sheet um, where some key information about the child would be collected and then available to people who were trying to help the child. So um, things that are not always typically asked. So communication, how does this child communicate? Uh, what does the child understand? Behavior, what are warning signs? What are triggers for behavior? Specifically, exactly what unsafe behaviors does this child have? Because the more we know, then the more we can be prepared and also less reactive to this child. And what helps them calm down? And finally, what activities or specific rewards does this child enjoy? So those were basic information. The second thing, principle, we thought was important was addressing the basics. So, you know, um, not being distracted and forgetting to be sure, is this child eating and drinking enough? Is the child sleeping? Are they in pain? Are they toileting adequately? You know, or are they constipated? These basics um, can get left behind when a more severe situation is going on, and um, but these are even more important to make sure they're addressed during those times. The third is to support predictability, as we did with the case example I gave you. Um, if we increase predictability, that will reduce problem behaviors overall on average. Um, so it's recognizing that this child is in a new environment, but that we all need to have the answers to these questions pretty much all the time, which is, what am I doing right now? What am I doing next? What are the expectations of me? When will I get to eat? When will I get to do something I like doing? So most of us carry the answers to these questions with us most of the time. And if we don't have the answer, that can be kind of anxiety provoking or agitating. Well, some of our people with autism can't get the answer. They don't have the answer to these questions or some of them all the time or some of the time. And so we need to provide it for them and that increases predictability. And that predictability increases stability and decreases challenging behaviors in general. We need to supply a behavior plan that targets the specific problem behavior. Um, and generally, we need higher frequency and more specific rewards than people are used to supplying to neurotypical children. Neuro neurotypical child has a problem behavior, you might uh, you know, um, uh, address it once a day and they might get a reward once a week. Um, 
with our kids with autism or individuals with autism, we're going to have to address that much more frequently and uh, specifically. And so, you know, using rewards is okay. It decreases problem behavior. Sometimes people mix the word reward with bribes, um, and I would say that rewards are not a bribe. A bribe is something you get even though you don't deserve it, uh, and that's trying to influence you in an inappropriate way. A reward um, is something that you get because you've done the appropriate thing. And we all get rewards. Many of us get it on a two-week frequency in the form of our paycheck, um, but we all get rewards. The more dis delayed or distressed an individual is, then the higher f the frequency often needs to be for that reward or feedback. The other area, another area we we stress is developing concrete coping strategies. So um, in this graphic, we have increasing agitation as time goes on. So here we have a person at baseline. We're in kind of prevention maintenance mode. They start to get agitated. I would call those early warning signs, and we hope to pick up on those. Then we have agitation loss of control, and then if it progresses to loss of control, then you may have to have some safety issues. And then we have a de-escalation period and a return to more stability, although we call it the alert zone, because at this point we are not back to baseline typically after a safety event where we may look calm, but we're at, still at a high, heightened level of agitation internally typically. So anyway, where we want to intervene is early, if at all possible. And we're always doing prevention, but we all get upset at times, and we want to intervene early. And so some of our primary interventions are actually to back away, give a person space and time, lower demands at that moment. And then one intervention strategy we use is something called the coping card. Um, and what it is, is giving the person a visual and text reminder of different strategies they can use when they're upset to try to de-escalate. And so if they're verbal, it could be talking with staff. Um, and verbal and less verbal, there are some other more concrete strategies, such as taking deep breaths, taking a break, listening to music, those types of things. I'm going to, for the sake of time, skip forward a little bit here. Um, and say, so that's the coping card. Um, our last area um, that we kind of uh, highlight for programs who want to be more population is um, that everyone, even folks who are verbal with autism or intellectual disability, still need usually some level of support to effectively communicate. Uh, and so we kind of emphasize total communication, meaning um, we're going to help them communicate, whether it's verbal, sign language gestures, uh, written or visual aids or AC devices or programs. Uh, I'm going to skip these and uh, just say in summary um, that children with autism can develop serious behavioral challenges um, and the among the many problems with that is that it puts them at risk for um, polypharmacy, which is the use of multiple medications. It can lead to them being excluded from their community uh, activities and their educational setting, can lead to hospitalization and also out-of-home placement. Um, I think a major takeaway I'd like you to have from this presentation is that um, depending on the severity and the, how long the behavior has been going on, the work of a single discipline can not be enough to address what is often a multifactorial or multi-source problem. Um, and so coming from that, then successful treatment can typically require a broad multidisciplinary diagnostic approach where we try to manage acute symptoms and ameliorate the key perpetuating factors, things like sleep deprivation, psychiatric comorbidity, communication inefficiencies, environmental reinforcement, and others. A couple resources for folks. Um, so one resource uh, that I was involved in and I think is, is uh, uh, a good document is um, something that's called the Autism Spectrum Disorder, the Parents Medication Guide. Um, 
so this just came out in the past year. It is available for download uh, to be downloaded for free at www.acap.org, which is the site of the American Academy of Child and Adolescent Psychiatry. Uh, this guide, even though it's supposed to focus on medications, we actually spent half of the length of this guide working through these different domains and talking about how to assess challenging behaviors before you turn to medication uh, or instead of medication. And then this guy does go into the evidence for medication treatments. Um, so I think this is uh, can be useful to parents and providers in thinking about how to work through challenging behaviors. Other resources, um, if you want to drill in deeper, uh, maybe at a more uh, academic level, um, we did produce an entire issue of the what's called the Clinics, uh, Child and Adolescent Psychiatric Clinics of North America, where there's a series of articles <clears throat> about the acute management of autism spectrum disorders, which actually I didn't really like the title. It was supposed to be acute management of challenging behaviors in people with autism spectrum disorder. But anyway, there's a whole article in here on communication interventions, a whole article on applied behavioral analysis, a whole article on medication management. So uh, that can be uh, looked up and ordered, I believe, online or at a library. And then a couple uh, journal articles. Um, we gathered up some of this information as consensus statements on best practices um, in the in the Journal of Child and Adolescent Psychiatry uh, in December 2015. And then um, my colleague here in Maine, Dr. McGuire, uh, published a pathway for the assessment and treatment of irritability and autism in the journal Pediatrics in 2015. I believe that's available for free download on the Pediatrics Journal website. So I just want to acknowledge that many people are involved in our treatment and research work uh, and uh, appreciate all of their efforts as well as the families and, and individuals we work with. And thank you very much. And we'll open it up for questions. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Siegel. Um, this is Jill Escher back here. Uh, thank you so much for that great overview. Uh, very much appreciate it. Um, people, uh, please feel free to type in your questions to in the question bar. Uh, just click on the arrow right by questions, and there's a little bar right there. Um, so I, I actually want to start off with a quick question. Um, I, I see in a lot of families that I know, um, you know a need to treat the comorbid psychiatric issues such as ADHD or such as anxiety. And I'm wondering if you, you know, without you know, endorsing a particular approach, maybe just give a couple of case studies you know, where you've done that successfully with medication or other treatments. Sure. Um, so in the case of ADHD, um, uh, so there's a lot one could say about each of those topics, but to, to just address it briefly. Um, so in the case of ADHD, um, the first question is, do we, do we have ADHD? Um, and, and so we have to go through a diagnostic process for that. But if that is identified, uh, that we have inattention or hyperactivity kind of beyond the, the norm in autism, um, then um, the choices are to uh, address, the question is what modality to address that from. Uh, and so your question was more around medication management, just to say you could develop some behavioral strategies, classroom modifications, um, sensory strategies to try to address that, or at least um, moderate it. Uh, but in terms of medication management, um, th this is one of the areas where we actually do have some good evidence to guide us. Um, and there actually was a pathway published in pediatrics once again on medication treatment for ADHD and autism, uh, I think in roughly 2014, 2015. But the short of it is, is the first line treatment for ADHD pharmacologically in autism, as well as in neurotypical children, uh, are um, stimulant medications um, primarily. So the, the um, research has been done on methylphenidate, which is um, commonly known as Ritalin or Concerta or Focalin. Um, that's our first line agent. Um, and then there's another um, form of that type of, of uh, medication called um, Adderall, uh, which is am uh, mixed amphetamine salts. Um, so stimulants are the first line treatment. And then second line, uh, there's actually uh, also been multiple studies um, on both um, 
what are called alpha agonists, which are guanfacine, which is 10x or intuniv, um, or clonidine, followed by then multiple studies on a medication called adamoxetine, which is stratera. Um, and of course, every medication has two names just to make life confusing, so that's why I gave you both names for each medication. So those are the basic steps for um, treatment, you know, one step at a time pharmacologically for ADHD in uh, autism. Okay. Hey, Jill, um, can you, I have a request to actually put up the resources slide again. Um, and I do have a question for you, uh, Dr. Siegel. Um, can you define motor brakes? <laughs> yes. Um, so motor brakes is uh, what we called it in our program where we designed a, there's two resources slides, so I'm giving you a little time on each. Um, uh, <clears throat> Uh, that's what we called our program of having the kids get up. This was designed by our occupational therapists, um, having the kids get up at um, some frequency. I think it's either hourly or every two hours and engage in a short series, four or five minutes of motor activities that activate uh, stimulate different systems, um, uh, physiologic systems. So I think they do wall push-ups for 30 seconds and then they do bouncing on a ball and then they blow a pinwheel. So that's what motor brakes are and I think we've found that um, that is helpful for kids to helps them stay regulated as well as gives them a quick break from from what they're doing. And it's really probably something we all should do, uh, particularly those of us who, if we're sitting at desk jobs. Thank you. Um, what do you think of medical marijuana and its efficacy? Aha. Uh -huh. um, so we knew that question would come. Uh, and it is a good question because people are experimenting at home with marijuana, uh, be it medical or not. Um, and uh, so the problem is I can't answer the question about efficacy because efficacy means it has been tested. And unfortunately, there have not been any published uh, results that I'm aware of of a rigorous trial of marijuana or the active ingredients in marijuana being THC or, or CBD cannabinoids um, for treatment of any particular symptom in autism. Uh, many of us would like to see that study done, of course, and um, uh, there may in fact be one uh, underway in Israel, as I understand it, um, because I think every intervention that we want to use and that we want to um, put energy and money and resources into needs to be ideally tested so we know if it's helpful or not. Um, and we also need to learn what the side effects are um, and is what we're seeing a side effect or is it the main effect that we're looking for? So um, certainly, you know, I've had anecdotal experience with it where um, we've had kids where it's a problem for them and we've had other kids where it seemed like it might be helpful, um, but we really don't know, I would say, as a field until it's rigorously tested. <clears throat> I think the other challenge with it right now is um, how do we know what the dose and the potency is of what is being given to the child and is that varying day to day or week to week? Um, so those are some challenges, uh, but hopefully there's more to learn in that area. Uh, thank you. Um, <clears throat> we'll, um, I have a question about seizures and whether or not these kids tend to grow out of them or you know, what kind of medications do they typically provide? Um, I do not have any information about whether they grow out of them. Um, they are more common in the more severely affected kids, kids who have intellectual disability uh, or who are more delayed, developmentally delayed. Um, in terms of treatment, uh, I don't believe that they, they're basically treated like seizures in neurotypical kids. So depending on the character, you choose the antiepileptic or the seizure medicine based on the kind of pattern and character of the seizures. And while I'm not a neurologist, uh, I 
you know, have lots of kids, of course, who have seizures and on seizure medication, and it appears to me that the pattern of, of medication treatment for the seizures is similar to what's used with, who are, with kids who are neurotypical. Okay. Uh, how do you know when aggression is caused by seizures or psychoses, uh, mm -hmm. poor mobility in nonverbal children? And if they are, what would be the treatment plans? Right. So, you know, uh, unpacking this, this uh, uh, what is going on in a nonverbal child is, is perhaps more challenging than, than other kids because obviously you, you can't uh, necessarily get answers to questions from the individual themselves. Um, and so it's based really on observation and kind of careful investigation. Um, so if, if it's uh, related, you know, it's rare, I will say, that a behavior is clearly related to a seizure disorder. Um, it does happen, but it's relatively rare. Um, so the question would be, is the person having seizures? And typically that's something that's evident and you can observe and, and detect whether they're having seizures or not. And then if you uh, want to confirm, then you would typically go to neurology, get an e EEG, and, and try to look at uh, for seizure activity <clears throat> on that test. Uh, in terms of psychiatric comorbidity, um, this is also a challenge, particularly with a nonverbal individual. Um, and so I'll just say, frankly, you're the best chance of diagnosing a co-occurring psychiatric disorder in a nonverbal, more severely affected person with autism is getting to a mental health provider who has experience with this population, um, at least some experience. And that is um, definitely a challenge uh, in many areas of the country. Um, so to identify that, you know, ideally that's if it's a child, uh, child psychiatrist or an adult psychiatrist who has some experience with, with people with autism, uh, that developmental behavioral pediatricians um, can sometimes be helpful with those diagnoses. Uh, there's far too few of them as there are far too few psychiatrists. Sometimes neurologists uh, have some facility at this. Uh, though it's not their typical training. And then um, mental health, other mental health providers, uh, such as social workers, uh, psychologists, certainly, um, if they're familiar with the population, I think they may be able to diagnose a co-occurring um, disorder. And so then the treatment really depends on what you're diagnosing. Um, okay, thank you. Uh, can you please comment on PANS, P-A-N-S? Ah, we're hitting all the the non the easy non controversial topics. Um, so I think we did okay with Very marijuana. <laughs> <laughs> uh, <clears throat> so pans, uh, uh, which is uh, I'm not even going to try to do the acronym, but it uh, it's attempts to describe a syndrome that's been described um, that's thought to relate to um, post-streptococcal infection um, or other autoimmune reactions related to infectious agents. Um, uh, it's, an, it's a emerging controversial area in that um, we still don't have, I think, a lot of information, a lot of data on it. Um, it's not clear how common it is. Um, uh, however, there appear to be kids who, you know, the description of this fits their picture. Um, how to treat it and um, uh, is is still very unclear, um, uh, but is generally approached as a, you know, an autoimmune disorder, and so then you're looking at autoimmune treatments, um, but. Uh, I guess I would just say that um, before, you know, I've seen lots of kids where that was raised, but it wasn't the case. Um, and so I think, you know, we have to look for, you know, there's a saying in medicine, which is when you hear hoofbeats, think horses, not zebras. So I think maybe that's an important concept is to try to go after common things first. So, you know, OCD is, 
has some commonality in autism um, and repetitive behaviors obviously are part of the core definition of autism and so um, you're going to want to look at those things first and look at more typical treatments um, and look at the history of how, how this um, presented to try to ferret out is this something that you might even you might think of some of a zebra like pans or pandas um, versus more common things. Uh, thank you for that. Um, can you talk a little bit about ECT as a treatment for ongoing severe aggressive behaviors? Aha. Uh -huh. um, well, I believe, correct me if I'm wrong, Jill, that you recently had a webinar from Amy Lutz on this topic or are going to have it? Yes, and it's recorded um, on our on our web page. Yes, she did. She did cover it. Okay, so uh, do you have any thoughts? Uh, yes, I'll give thoughts, but I would say if you're interested in this topic, you should certainly view that webinar because Amy Lutz has uh, is a parent, uh, uh, has written a book about her own childhood who went through ECT treatment for severe, severe behavior um, that did not respond to anything else, and uh, I think has you know is 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 probably uh, you know an expert in this area who's not a provider but is an expert nonetheless. Um, my thoughts are I have a little bit of experience, tiny bit of experience with this. Uh, my thought and I think most people's thought in the field is in cases where we have severe uh, life-threatening um, or severely life-limiting behaviors that have not responded to rigorous evidence-based treatments like applied behavioral analysis, rigorous psychopharm trials, uh, um, you know, multidisciplinary approaches, and we have a situation that is 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 unlivable, irreconcilable, um, then we have to look for for some type of solution. And um, ECT has been helpful as reported in some case reports. So these are not trials or studies, they're case reports. Um, in some individuals with autism with severe refractory behaviors that did not respond to anything else. We're talking about, you know, the 0.01% here. So I want to be very clear, very rare. Um, I've had one case myself, um, but uh, it is something to consider when all else uh, has failed and at least the field has some experience with it and there's been some case reports. Um, and ECT itself is something that is well researched. It's not well researched in autism, but in general, it's well researched. And I think the risks and side effects are well understood. Um, great, thank you. I think we have time for one more question. Um, how can you determine what the behavior is reinforcing? Ah. Um, so I think the thing, uh, the way to th a way to think about it is to flip that around and say what is reinforcing the behavior. So um, what, in other words, what 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 is reinforcing the behavior? So what maintains the behavior? So an example being, uh, if I am in, I, I guess I don't like math today because I keep referring to math. Um, uh, so if I'm in math class and I'm given a problem that's too hard or I hate math and my uh, response to that um, event is to hit my teacher or my educational aid and then the consequence of that is I get taken out of the classroom, uh, which is typically what happens um, in, in your typical school setting. Um, you could then look at that situation and say, well, what is the effect of the taking out of the classroom? Well, you could propose that it's reinforcing the hitting behavior because the consequence was to have the demand, the thing that I don't like, which is the math, disappear. I get taken out of the classroom and I don't have to do the math problem. So it's actually a perfect strategy uh, that makes perfect sense, completely logical. Uh, way to not engage in math uh, is to hit someone um, because the result is in that case was that I got removed from the classroom and the math disappeared. So you would say that that, um, that uh, response, the removing from the classroom, is reinforcing or maintaining that behavior. Okay, thank you. Um, so that wraps it up for us. Oh, you want to go ahead, Jill? Yeah, I was just going to say thank you so much, uh, Christina, and thank you, Dr. Siegel. Um, 
Uh, and I just want to assure everybody that uh, this has been recorded and we will get uh, that, actually the, the same link that you use to register, you can use to access the recording. Okay, so if you want to go back to some slides or you know, uh, go back to some links, you can get that there. Okay, so um, thank you so much and we will send out information about our upcoming uh, webinars in this series. Um, it's already posted on our website as well. And um, thank you very much, Dr. Siegel, thank you again. And everyone have a wonderful day.